conference schedule is divided into three different rooms in the auditorium. We also have a banquet hall in the downstairs community area. And there's also room one, which most of our um, off the record session is conducted in. Guys, are we ready? All right, I've been told that everything is cool, so I can introduce our first speaker. So here we are at the start of this uh, big data conference. And this morning, we are going to focus on where you put your data, databases and data stores. We have four talks in a row, all about databases and data stores. And our first speaker is Dharma Shukla, a distinguished engineer at Microsoft. Now, he built a globally distributed database called Azure Cosmos, and he's here to tell the story of a, how he created a system that stores hundreds of petabytes of data and handles trillions of requests every day. Donna? Thank you. Hi. Good morning, guys. Um, I'm going to talk about the lessons that uh, we learned in building a global distributed database system in Cosmos DB. Uh, but first, how many of you have used Azure? How many of you are familiar with NoSQL databases? Great. How many of you are familiar with SQL databases? So, um, my team and I, we spent seven years, uh, you know, blood, sweat, and tears. We worked uh, all over energy and time and care for seven long years to build uh, a system which is globally distributed. And um, I'm going to talk about the capabilities that the system exposes to developers and uh, the lessons we learned in building the system. So our journey started in 2010 uh, with zero lines of code. Uh, we had a prototype of uh, of the system that uh, that we were pairing with existing NoSQL databases back in 2010. So back in 2010, Microsoft needed a database uh, that. And this database had to serve the needs for uh, applications like Xbox, Office, Windows, and uh, Active Directory, and, and a bunch of these large-scale applications from Microsoft. All of these applications had a few core requirements. They all wanted turnkey global distribution. What it means is that they wanted the data from Office. They wanted to have the database expose a single system image of a table and made the data available wherever the users are, worldwide, you know, in a in an easy to use, easy to use, clicking a button uh, or calling an API kind of way. They wanted low latency across the world, so guaranteed low latency. They wanted high availability. They wanted programmable consistency. When you're when you're dealing with a database that is globally distributed in the in the happy path in steady state, you have to deal with you have to navigate the speed of light to give low latency. And during the failures, you have to confront the cap theorem and to ensure the, the high availability of the system. So, um, you know, the standard trade-offs between strong consistency and eventually eventual consistency were not good enough. Uh, developers inside Microsoft wanted programmable consistency. Uh, eventual, eventual consistency uh, is great for getting high availability, but doesn't let you write, uh, you know, intuitive applications. So they wanted programmability. They wanted to elastically scale throughput and storage worldwide and pay only for the throughput that they need. So depending on the workload spikes, they wanted to programmatically, you know, scale out, scale back the throughput ac across the world at different times across different regions. And all of these things, uh, these applications wanted at really, really low cost. So this was the this was the laundry list. This was the this was the requirement list that we started with. And we realized very soon when we started building it, and the first party applications within Microsoft started using it we realized that none of these requirements were unique to, to uh, Microsoft applications. In fact, all applications around the world which are running on cloud uh, would need some uh, a database system uh, which is built to give these properties. So that's what we did. Uh, earlier this year, we started with Project Torrance. Uh, 
because that's where, that was the, the town in which we had the first working prototype back in 2010. And this is a long journey. We, 2017, we released uh, this uh, product to the rest of the, the rest of develop, the developers on Azure. At some point between 2010 and 2017, we had a, we had a slice of the system, a portion of the system exposed uh, on Azure as, as a service called Document DB. And then 2017, we, we exposed all of the infrastructure in the form of Cosmos DB. So that's the, that's the journey. Um, before I go further, let me, let me explain um, what Cosmos DB is in a two minute video clip. And there's no one who can do it better than uh, Leslie Lamport. Cosmos DB is a database system in which the data can be replicated and copies distributed throughout the world. This permits an application to be configured so every user is near a copy of the data without the application programmer having to worry about how many copies there are or where they're located. My TLA plus specification language and its tools were used to improve the design of Cosmos DB, helping ensure its robustness. The Cosmos DB team credits TLA plus with helping them provide great SLAs to our customers. The work of other researchers at Microsoft Research and elsewhere was crucial to developing the five different consistency models that Cosmos DB allows developers to choose from. Many consistency models have been proposed in research papers over the years, but to my knowledge, Cosmos DB is the only commercial system that has tried to identify the useful ones and implement them precisely. Implementing any distributed system involves a trade-off between, on the one hand, the degree of consistency it provides to the users, and on the other hand, its availability and response time. I believe that today, commercially available databases offer only two choices. Perfect consistency, sometimes called strong consistency, and eventual consistency. Cosmos DB provides three additional intermediate choices. I expect that developers will use this flexibility to obtain the trade-off between consistency and performance that they find best for their applications. So when we started the project, we wanted to build a database that is designed for the cloud. And we asked ourselves, you know, what are the unique properties? If we were to build SQL Server for the cloud, for, for today's age, what, what, what would be the design centers of that database? We wanted to build a next generation database designed for the cloud. And we found three properties that are unique uh, that we must exploit as a cloud provider. So if you're Amazon, if you're Google, if you're Microsoft, and if you're one of the public cloud provider companies, and you are in the business of building a new database, then you better exploit these three properties. So number one was global distribution. Azure is ubiquitous. You know, Azure envelopes the, the planet Earth. It's, it has data centers, hundreds of data centers across 40 regions uh, as of now, and it's constantly growing its regional footprint. So if you deploy an application on Azure, then your application is Azure by virtue of being omnipresent makes your application available around the world instantly. So you get to deploy your front ends all around the world. So that you, know, you have your users, wherever your users are, your front ends of your applications are running. But what about the database? Database is still siloed, it's still stranded in one region. And maybe for the DR purposes, you, know, you, you have your database configured to have uh, another replica or a backup uh, in another region. That's not a globally distributed database is about. Globally distributed database would mean that it makes the copies of your data ubiquitous, available wherever the users are, such that you get a single system image of your table with the replicas all around the world, and you can scale throughput and storage around the world, and the application front ends get low latency access to the data wherever the data may be. So that's what, that's exploiting the, the the, the innate global distribution capability that only a cloud has. So that's one. The second property that the cloud provides that as a database provider you must exploit, as we learned, is that uh, cloud provides elasticity. So you should be able to horizontally partition 
a single table uh, into any number of partitions and then distribute each partition is made highly available by a, by a replication and then distribute those partitions all around the world such that you can scale out throughput on a single a single uh, table if you want you know 1 million transactions per second on a single table across different regions in the world you can do that and then you can scale back if you don't have enough traffic you can scale it back to 100 transactions per second across all regions or across some regions so that kind of elasticity of throughput and storage on a single table is something that uh, if you were to design a database that knows how to exploit we are we, we want to break out of the shackles of a single machine or even a single cluster or even a single data center we want to have you know horizontally partition system so that's the second property the third property which is very unique to cloud is the fact that cloud cloud by virtue of its abstraction there is a the fact that there is an indirection called the cloud you can you have the opportunity to pack hundreds of hundreds of tenants or customers data and their and their workloads on a single machine and then you can pack thousands of customers and their workloads across a cluster of machines and do dynamic load balancing of the data of different customers you can do the same across clusters within a data center across data centers within a region this this the fact that cloud provides this indirection or abstraction allows you to to no longer be restricted to a single machine a, a database instance doesn't belong to uh, a machine now multiple instances of users database or slices of users database can be packed on the uh, of across many many users can be packed on a single machine and you know across clusters and that allows a real cost efficiencies that just cannot be achieved when you build a database that is designed to exploit all of the resources of the machine so this cannot be the observation is that all of these three properties cannot be an afterthought so if you build a database that is designed to 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 use all of the resources available on a machine you cannot after the fact uh, add rate limiting and and resource governance to your b3 or your query processor or your replication protocol you cannot after the fact add global distribution on a database that is designed for primary backup or dr capabilities you cannot add horizontal partitioning as a bolt on on top of a database that was designed to scale up and not scale out so observation number 1 these three properties uh, uh, cannot be an afterthought observation number 2 that these three properties compose with each other so you can you can have a, a a single table that is globally distributed as well as horizontally partitioned you can have a single table that is globally distributed horizontally partitioned and it's also multi tenant so uh, that's that's one of the one of the center central uh, you know uh, uh, a theme that runs across the architecture of cosmos db we we learned in a very hard way how to exploit these three properties so what does it mean to build a globally distributed database what does it mean to have global distribution from the ground up the first thing uh, we've done is that uh, whenever azure opens a new data center or a new region uh, cosmos db is installed uh, by default so it's it's present uh, it, it's its presence doesn't mean that uh, you have a uh, replication enabled but it's present it's available across the world so that allows you to that allows you to just go to the map of the world and select different regions uh, like so you have the map of the world you simply select different regions uh, let me so this is a this is a, a, a single table that is distributed across 1 2 3 4 5 regions and i'm going to add uh, and these are the five regions this is an app uh that shows these uh, you know the 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 blue dot is the database replica and the red dot represents the application instance the front end that is working against that uh replica of a table um and these are the these are the five regions it is in i'm going to add the sixth region i'm going to add brazil south and once i add it and i save it it's going to add this new region and then the data will automatically start replicating from this point on this is as easy as it gets that's what i mean by turnkey uh, uh global distribution so you can associate any number of regions with your 
with your database instance and you can even restrict what regions you want to replicate or constraint your data replication. So if you're in sovereign clouds like government clouds or China or Germany and you want your data not to leave that country or that, that sovereign domain, you can also configure a policy that, that restricts it. But in general, you can, you can, you can simply distribute your data uh, by selecting um, the map of the world. Uh, all the APIs that the database system expose, uh, exposes are multi-homeable. So what it means is that uh, whenever a disaster happens, uh, you don't have to redeploy your app. So imagine your database is spread across, you know, those five regions and the sixth one that we just added. And uh, if one of the regions uh, goes down, uh, you don't have to redeploy your app to, to now, you know, configure your app to talk to one of the other uh, data centers or regions. Uh, all of the endpoints are logical. So your application continues to operate with logical endpoints, or logical URIs. Uh, and this is very different than, uh, you know, if you're building a database that is designed for DR capabilities or disaster recovery capabilities, therein, you know, you also have to redeploy your app after the disaster uh, uh, occurs. So, so this guarantees that you have high availability of your application uh, without requiring you to redeploy the app. Uh, you can you can dynamically configure uh, the, the 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 priorities of your region. So with uh, the six regions that we just associated, uh, the Azure regions we associated with that table in that um, demo app. Uh, if you add more regions or remove more regions, uh, uh, remove regions, or you can set the priorities of the regions. So you can say if U.S. West goes down, I want you to fail over to U.S. East. If it, if that also goes down, I want you to fail over to Singapore or India and so. So uh, you can set that. You can also test the end-to-end -end availability of your application, not just the database, by simulating a failover. So you can say, I want to simulate a failover and, and make sure that uh, not only the database uh, remains highly available, but my entire application stack also operates in a high, highly available manner. So this is, in fact, a proof of uh, a globally distributed system. If you have a globally distributed database system, uh, then it must allow, as we learned, the users to fail over at will. So every day in our lifecycle telemetry, we see lots of customers failing over and testing um, the end-to-end -end availability of their application. And this is this is crucial because you don't want to uh, take a chance on probability of a you know region going down and, and the database or your application surviving. So this is what we mean uh, by by uh, turnkey global distribution. The finally one of the one of the crucial uh, elements of this is giving SLAs not just for high availability, but when you are a globally distributed database, uh, as we learned, you have to give SLAs for high availability, low latency at the 99th percentile, consistency, as well as throughput. These are the four dimensions. High availability, consistency, low latency, and throughput are the four different sort of legs of the globally distributed database stool. So when it comes to latency, we give less than 10 millisecond latency at P99 uh, for all the reads around the world. We give less than 15 millisecond latency for writes, which are fully indexed writes. Uh, I'll talk about uh, the indexing in a, in a, in a, in a minute. Uh, and the, the way we give these uh, latency guarantees is because of two, two central reasons. Number one, we have designed the replication protocol such that um, the in order to meet the quorums, the, 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 we, we always do local reads and writes. So you never, have to, you never have to consult replicas which are spread across regions in order to serve a read or a write. So that's, that's a, a crucial design choice of the replication protocol and the consistency models that we expose, they also take into account uh, that. So that's, that's uh, a, a core piece of the low latency guarantees. The second thing um, that we've done is that we have a database engine that we've designed which brings the best of uh, NoSQL databases in terms of log structuring techniques. So we have, we've borrowed uh, really good ideas from uh, you know, 30 plus years of research and disparate file systems and, and disparate databases when it comes to log structuring techniques on the write path. So whenever there are updates or writes, we, have, we, have, we employ uh, some of these techniques and I'll talk about it in a second. For the read path, we have taken uh, the B trees. So uh, the relational world, uh, there's a there's a there's a great history and, and lineage of uh, database engine design, which is optimized for serving queries and reads. 
So we've taken the, the best data structures from on the read path, married them with the best data structures and techniques from the write path, and built a database engine that is capable of ingesting sustained volumes of writes. And as we ingest, we can automatically index all of the content that we ingest uh, without requiring secondary indexes or schemas from developers. And uh, write locally to the disk in terms of large sequential flushes that we do on the disk, as well as replicate it uh, with every replica durably committing it before the write gets acknowledged. This is on the write path. And because these log structured uh, writes are married on, on top of this log structure storage engine is a, is a B tree as, as, as the data structure. Uh, we serve uh, really low latency queries. So, so this, we have a VLDP paper if you guys are interested in, in uh, the database engine design. Yeah, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very unique uh, database engine which, uh, which we have for benchmarks against uh, the popular rocks, uh, you know, log structured engines like uh, RocksDB and LevelDB and, and, and such. So, uh, so, so those are the two techniques that we employed and the paper describes it in great detail. Now, if, since you're familiar with NoSQL databases, you know that uh, horizontal partitioning is key. So we do that, you know, the, you can take a single table and, uh, and we will automatically manage the partitions on your behalf so that the table transparently grows as it, you, you ingest more data in, uh, in the table. If you, if you want to scale the throughput, you can also scale the throughput. I'll talk about scaling the throughput in a second. But so there's nothing fundamentally groundbreaking about um, uh, scaling the table or a database for, uh, by, by virtue of doing partition management. It's, a, it's like any other horizontally partitioned uh, uh, NoSQL system. But the, but the key piece here is that we make sure that the data is also replicated. Uh, so high availability is key. So how the partition management is done in context of uh, global replication is, uh, is a unique piece here. And uh, you can also optionally uh, time out all of the data that you've ingested. So you can set uh, TTL on, on the table or TTL on individual records and, and uh, let it time out. And we make sure that uh, the notion of time uh, across uh, when, you have a, when you have a single table uh, which is horizontally partitioned and distributed around the world, the notion of time, the physical time, is also preserved. So we employ uh, a variant of hybrid logical clocks to make sure that uh, if, a, if a record has expired in one of the regions, uh, and so if you issue a query after it has expired, uh, the query is not going to return that document or that record as a result, and the same query, if you issue it any other part of the world, um, you still, you, the, the, the expiration is honored. So that requires that the physical time is married uh, with, the, with the replication protocol uh, when we do the distribution. So far, am, am I making sense? Um, but the, but the, the real meaty problems start emerging when we want to scale out throughput. So scaling storage is, is, is okay, but you see application activity around the world, application instances, those front ends are accessing data around the world and you know, uh, customers want to provision different throughput across different regions at different times. So how do you scale a single table from you know, 100 transactions per second to a million transactions to a billion transactions per second differently across different parts of the world at different times? This poses uh, an enormous amount of challenge. Uh, it stresses all of those three pivots that I talked about, you know, global distribution, the design of the replication protocol, horizontal partitioning, partition management, and multi-tenancy and resource governance. In fact, we've designed the entire system as a, as a gigantic distributed queue with rate limiting and back pressure built in uh, across the entire stack, such that we can, we can guarantee the throughput that customers provision at any given point in time across different parts of the world. So what it means concretely is that uh, customers can write an API call, can, you can say, you know, table.throughput uh, equals 100 transactions per second, and the next line of code your application would write would say table.throughput equals million transactions per second. And within a finite bound of time, we have to honor, we have to scale out the single table, we have to distribute all the partitions and the replicas around the world, and make sure that now the new throughput is in effect. So that when you issue the uh, you know, request, 
uh, you, you, you get the throughput that you, you sort of provision. So this requires a fully resourced government stack. Uh, it requires a highly responsive partition management scheme so that uh, when, you, when you split a partition and you distribute it around the world for the throughput that it's supposed to honor, every replica, every partition is calibrated with the amount of throughput uh, it, is, it is supposed to deliver. And, and when every replica of a customer is placed in conjunction with thousands of other customers uh, on a same machine or across the cluster, we want to make sure that every one of these components live within a fixed amount of uh, system resources and deliver the throughput that, uh, that it's supposed to deliver. The interesting thing here is that uh, what we've done is that we allow customers to, to scale throughput both at a second and at a minute granularity. And there's something interesting about this. So uh, imagine uh, this orange line is, uh, is the line of uh, you know, the, the throughput on a table which is provisioned. Uh, so that's uh, some customer has provisioned that much throughput. And then the, the blue lines are the actual consumed, you know, the application the users are, are pounding on this table. And, and then there are spikes. So there is a spike. Uh, at the, at the 29th second, so this is a this is a minute, and within that minute, on the 29th second, you got a spike, you got another spike, you got another sp spike. So whenever there is a spike, uh, the throughput that was provisioned, the developer had configured, you know, th you know, uh, on that on that table, uh, configured some throughput, and then some unexpected spikes uh, came. So how do you smoothen out the spike? How do you predictably smoothen out the spike? So what we do is that we also allow the developers to specify the throughput at a minute granularity. So you say you want so many transactions per second, and then you say in addition to that, I also want some more transactions per minute. And whenever there is a spike in any second, we will smoothen out the spike by borrowing the throughput that you have reserved for that minute worth of uh, window. And so in this case, on the 29th second, there was a spike, and because there was enough budget for the minute, we smoothened it out, we smoothened it out, and so uh, this, we sell, uh, you know, customers purchase throughput at a second as well as at a minute granularity, and uh, by, by doing that, they get a predictable way of dealing with the spike. The, the throughput that uh, we, we, we offer customers on a minute granularity is cheaper than the one that we offer at a second granularity. So these kind of, these kind of uh, 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 capabilities can only be built if you, if you have designed the system with resource governance from the ground up. Uh, this is another example. Um, I'm not a golfer, but um, there's a, a famous uh, uh, golfing company uh, which manages uh, these tournaments. And so when US Open was there, um, this, uh, this organization had uh, two regions. It, it started with one region, East US 2. And then um, just around the, the US Open window, uh, this is the power of uh, you know, turnkey global distribution along with uh, uh, scaling throughput. Uh, so what they did was they also added US West, just like I showed in the, in the demo earlier, just click on the map of the world and added another region to the table. And you see during the US Open, so they got uh, high availability because they can now survive a regional disaster because they have another region. And they are using throughput across both regions now, the gray bars as well as the blue line during that window of time. And then uh, they're getting low latency access across both regions by virtue of adding that region. And then as soon as the US Open was done, we saw that this customer uh, removed that other region. And uh, so he doesn't have to pay for that other region. And, and continues with uh, the East US 2, that one region that they have. So this kind of turnkey global distribution, ability to scale, uh, get high availability, low latency, now we've, we've tried to simplify it, and this is, a, this is an example that shows that. The, one of the learnings here, uh, as we're building a system like this, is that uh, you know, there, is a, there is a vast array of uh, distributed systems and database literature rife with different uh, proposals of consistency models, like uh, Dr. Lamport said in the clip earlier. Uh, there are all sorts of consistency models uh, ranging from uh, uh, the gold standard that is linearizability and all the way to the weakest of the weak consistency models. And, uh, 
and when you when you deal with most NoSQL systems, uh, you configure them in different ways, and there's no telling exactly what guarantees are you getting. There is no TLA plus specification. There is no uh, guaranteed way of building an app. So you might lose data. You might lose availability. You may not get the low latency that you expect to get. Uh, you may not uh, at you know when the partition splits are happening or partitions are being managed. Maybe your performance degrades. There is no telling uh, what happens to those dimensions. There is also no telling how do you write an application um, that that can be can be reasoned over in a very intuitive manner. Just like when you write linearizable programs, you can you can reason over the, the sequential nature of the program by reading the program code. When it comes to eventually consistent databases, it's very hard to build an app. So what we did was that we asked this question to ourselves: that are there consistency models in this you know plethora of consistency model research work that has been done for you know four decades or so that are can be operationalized at scale, uh, can offer uh, intuitive practical uh, programming models uh, that people can, developers can build reasonable applications and they are, they are, they enable practical real world scenarios. So, you know, is there a consistency model for IoT? Is there a consistency model for web and mobile? Is there a consistency model for, for, um, for writing apps that are, you know, pop sub or messaging or, you know, where the data is shared by multiple producers and consumers? So we found by, by virtue of the fact that we had several large first party applications at Microsoft using the system, we tried many, many consistency models in terms of specifying them. Most of them were not even, you know, there was no specification for it. So specifying them uh, and then operationalizing them at scale and then we harvested the ones that survived. So, uh, so this is the this is the the binary choice. You get uh, red pill or the blue pill. You either get strong consistency with high latency trade-off, or you get eventual consistency with uh, low latency, but your programmability sucks. So, um, so that's what the state of the commercial databases is. And then we've exposed these intermediate consistency models. So strong gives you linearizable consistency. Bounded stainless says that your reads will lag behind writes by a delta t but you still get total global order of all your operations. Session says that you get monotonic reads, monotonic re writes, read your write guarantees. Consistent prefix says you get prefix order, the version order of the propagation of all your updates, and eventual is eventual. And what we found once we, once we expose it internally as well as externally, is that a vast majority of customers gravitated towards using this intermediate consistency models. Second thing, is that there are clear trade-offs. So strong and bounded stainless consistency for the price of the throughput, the transactions that you purchase. Uh, you know, you get, uh, you get half the amount of transactions when you're using those, uh, those stronger consistency models. As you get relaxed consistency models, you get, you know, double the throughput for the price you pay. So there's a clear trade-off. Uh, we also learned that high availability SLAs are not good enough. Uh, you have to give financially backed SLAs for all four uh, of these um, aspects of global distribution. Uh, and example of that is uh, Jet.com, which is one of, the, one of the popular retailers in the United States. Uh, during uh, Black Friday, so Cyber Monday window, they, they jack up the, the throughput uh, on their table uh, to close to 10 million requests per second. And then we, 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 we observe the availability during that window of time. Uh, as they started spiking during that window of time, you know, there was an availability dip because one of the upgrades happened, uh, was rolled out during that time. But still we maintained uh, the 4.9 availability that we had and this, this table is spread across two regions. So we maintained the global availability as well. Uh, we continue to maintain the latency guarantees and all of these uh, matrix, we transparently publish it to all customers. So they can see uh, the, the latency, availability, throughput, uh, consistency as their workloads are pounding on the database. We also learned that at scale, nobody wants to do alter table, um, you know, to create index, drop index, uh, manage schemas, deal with secondary indexes. Most NoSQL databases uh, still ask you to configure secondary indexes. And when you're globally distributed, it's a, it's a nightmare to, to, to maintain indexes, maintain schemas. So what we have done, and this is the VLDB paper that I have the link at the end of the presentation, I would love for you guys to read it. What we do is that we take all of the records that we ingest. Here is an example of a JSON record that we ingest. And we turn every record that we ingest into a tree. These kind of logical layouts. 
So every label, every text uh, label in the, in, the, in the JSON representation became a, a node in the tree. And the query processor, the index management always operates at this uh, materialized trees. It doesn't care about the schema, so you can add or remove uh, you know, new records uh, with completely different schemas. In fact, you can have JSON documents containing uh, exclusively of GUIDs. Uh, we wouldn't care, we're just indexing the paths of these trees from the root to the leaves and then writing them sequentially on SSD uh, using log structuring uh, techniques. And then the query processor materializes these trees and operates uh, on these trees. So these logical layouts free us from the burden of, you know, free the developers from the burden of schema and index management altogether. So when you're rolling out your application upgrades uh, for a database that is distributed around the world, you don't have to, you don't have to uh, do water table or you don't have to keep the version of the schema of your application and the database in sync. You can have the old customers, old clients continue to operate using the old schema across replicas which you haven't rolled out the upgrade and the, the new customers work off of your new application schema. The queries are consistent and, um, and thanks to this uh, unique uh, design approach for the database engine. The other most uh, important realizations we had was that we, we realized that we don't want to create uh, our own query language or our own uh, you know, APIs. We found that developers are already using MongoDB and Cassandra and Gremlin for graph and so on. So once you have a schema agnostic database engine, you can, you can translate, efficiently translate all of these data models into uh, a core data model that the engine understands. Uh, and then expose the APIs that developers are already familiar with. So you can take your existing MongoDB app and point it to Cosmos DB and start programming against it without, without uh, uh, you know, any learning any new APIs. So, so I'm running out of time. Uh, so you can, you can have different data models like documents and key values and column family and graph and so on and, and different APIs. Uh, finally, we, we test the hell out of the system uh, uh, you can meet me after the talk if you're interested in how we test the system, how we do upgrades, how we run uh, the service. Um, summary, uh, globally distributed databases are hard to build. You should use when you have one that is highly available, reliable, and gives uh, great SLAs. Uh, schema agnostic database engine uh, designs are, are really, uh, they're, they're, they're moving the, the frontier in terms of uh, free the developers from the schema and index management altogether. Uh, there's a VLDB paper link uh, I mentioned. Uh, there are intermediate consistency models that the industry as a whole should harvest and, and operationalize because uh, there is a market for it. Uh, developers are willing to pay for the clear trade-offs if you expose uh, those intermediate, intermediate consistency models. And uh, as a globally distributed database, you need SLAs for all four dimensions. Uh, this is the schema agnostic indexing paper. A uh, bunch of other links. You can follow me on Twitter. You can follow Azure Cosmos DB on Twitter. Uh, and we are hiding. Thank you. Thank you very much. We have a few moments for questions and answers. Uh, yeah. Let's get you a microphone. We do have mic runners around, so those who have questions, we will send a microphone to you. We have three minutes for questions and answers, so there may not be very many. I saw a hand there and a hand there, and that's gonna be all. You can meet me after the, after the session. Hello. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah. Can I, can I ask? Yeah, Mac. Yes. So, so the question is that, uh, as, as uh, if you, if you know, we, we want the customers to pay for the throughput that they need, uh, and the window of time for 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 provisioning the throughput is an hour. So you pay for that hour. If you if you provision say 2,500 transactions per second, and if you if you start getting you know your your app gets you know 10,000 transactions in that second, you're going to get rate limited. So the way to get out of it is uh, you you write a piece of code in your front end 
which can increase or decrease the throughput uh, based on the incoming arrival rate. So you can avoid, uh, in the, the negative case, you can avoid the request rate too large. And in the positive case, you want to save some money. So you can lower the throughput if you're not getting incoming traffic. And there's a, there's a standard, uh, you know, 100 lines of code we can share with you. Okay, next yeah, question. I have a question. Yeah. Um, you, you didn't mention what transaction model is supported by Cosmos DB because obviously Mongo has you know one document per transaction whereas yeah so this is uh, this is uh, this supports uh, multi-item transactions okay. with snapshot isolation yeah so Last about question. your intermediate uh, consistency model between strong to the eventual uh, so have you seen any pattern about uh, about a certain uh, application domain gravitating toward a model like video streaming might be eventual and e-commerce might be strong. Can you shed some light yes. on that? Yes. Which uh, domain goes toward which? Yes. Session consistency is extremely popular with IoT, um, uh, extremely popular with web and mobile workloads. Uh, because, you know, when you're writing a, an app like a Twitter client, uh, when you as a user tweet, you want to see monotonic reads, monotonic writes, you want to see your tweets, uh, you want to see the causality of the the tweet stream uh, in your client app, in your within your session, but you don't care about you know universal global order of all the tweets, right? So these kind of scenarios where for web or mobile or IoT, wherever there's a user or a device involved, uh, so if you have your app rooted in a device ID or a user ID, session consistency is uh, by far the gives you the best trade-offs. Uh, Bounded stainless is great when you are globally distributed and you have multiple uh, publishers and consumers operating on the same piece of data. So bounded stainless we see in uh, people building pops up systems, queuing systems, messaging, chat, social apps. So bounded stainless is there. Uh, eventual, so eventual and strong are, are, are on the fringes. We see not too many use cases. Consistent prefix is the next one after session. But we have, we can, we can sync afterwards. I can walk through different observations we have found so far from usage. Thanks a lot.